welcome. Um, I'm just here to remind you of what panel you're in. So this is Breaking Barriers to Ensure Green and Blue Career Pathways. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I am going to pass it over to Diane Dillon Ridgely, Waterfront Alliance board member, to get us started. Because you didn't tell us who you were. <laughs> She's a very important person at the Waterfront Alliance. But good afternoon. I hope you had a wonderful lunch. Um, I actually sat here from the first session, so I didn't eat, and I missed what sounded like a really exciting session. But as people continue to come in, I want to thank you for coming here. Uh, this panel intrigued me and excited me because 50 years ago when I started, that's a hard thing to be able to say. <laughs> you couldn't major in environmental studies. The, I mean, I was at EPA as an intern after the agency was about 18 months old. So obviously I was around when dinosaurs roamed the earth, but <laughs> we've made some progress in the, and since then, and the fields and the jobs and the green pathway employment uh, and engagement has really expanded tremendously, and that is exciting. And so that's what we're going to talk about here today. Now I have a little paragraph to read. Breaking barriers to ensure green and blue career pathways for the existing workforce is a crucial step towards a uh, sustainable future. As various industries prepare for a changing climate, businesses and organizations are increasingly looking for ways to address an aging <coughs> workforce and attract new staff. The pa this panel will review the progress on various employment initiatives across the region, including the American Jobs Act, how to reduce the barriers to bringing frontline communities and workers from other sectors to these careers. And I know we're going to do a good job talking about that. And is, was it Barry? Preston. Preston. Well, I didn't keep it very long. What is your name? <laughs> say Sorry? Your, say your name again. Preston. Hi, y'all. I'm Preston. Oh, hi, Preston. Preston is going to moderate this for you. These are some excellent panelists. I know you're going to have a lively and bright conversation, so take it away, Preston. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here, you guys. Um, really looking forward to this conversation. We've got some really wonderful panelists um, to discuss exactly what Diane's talking about today. Um, so before we get into the actual discussion, I would like to actually introduce them. Um, and I'll go ahead and start with myself. My name is Preston Anderson. I'm the Assistant Vice President for Workforce Development uh, at NYC EDC. That's the Economic Development Corporation. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with that organization. Just in case you're not, EDC um, as an institution uh, exists to like propagate economic development across uh, the five boroughs of New York City. Um, our nexus here is that we actually own a lot of waterfront assets and do a lot of waterfront development um, and have a lot of uh, in just general investment into the green economy, into the blue economy. Um, and so that's that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so I'll, I'll start here with Carrie. If Carrie, if you could please introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, thank you, Preston, and happy to be here. <clears throat> My name is Carrie Bowie. I'm the uh, co-founder, president, and executive director of an organization called Browning the Green Space. So we're a cross-sector group of organizations focused on promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in the clean energy space and beyond. Um, our vision is a just energy transition. And our mission is threefold. We want to create jobs, build wealth, and reduce energy burden uh, in communities in co of color. Uh, and we're based out of uh, Boston, but consider ourselves a regional organization in the Northeast. Great, yeah. Thank you. My name is Sandra Benia, External Affairs for Vineyard Offshore here in New York. Um, we have four leases from BOEM, one project under construction right now, Vineyard Wind 1, 800 megawatts slated to be done by the end of this year, so very exciting. Um, and three other leases, one off the coast of California, so far away, one south of Long Island, and one east of New York, south of Massachusetts. So looking to partner with a lot of our community stakeholders, governments, um, and also coordinate with our development team on fisheries and tribal engagement uh, to make sure that our projects are done in a responsible way. And I'm Brian Gray. I am the development director for Community Offshore Wind, which is a um, another offshore wind developer, uh, which is made up of RWE, which is a global um, energy company, and National Grid, which is um, a local utility here in New York and, and Massachusetts. Um, our um, lease area uh, that Community Offshore Wind is looking to develop is about 60 miles south of um, Long Island. And um, we're hoping to you know, provide uh, up to three isolated projects out of that lease area. That's great. 
Thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor to be with you guys today. I'm very excited to have this conversation. And I think actually one of the best ways to sort of set this conversation will be to give us a clear definition of what the green economy and the blue economy actually is. I think um, especially blue economy, that's a, that was a newer term for me when I started my role at EDC. Um, and I, I think green economy, we actually tend to think of that pretty narrowly. We tend to think of it as strictly just renewable energy. For I think most people think of it that way. But it's a pretty expansive industry. and so. Um, I kind of wanted to upstand one of EDC's big projects that just got released in February of this year, um, which is the Green Economy Action Plan. I actually have a colleague here who um, helped uh, develop in, in some of that work, specifically as it relates to offshore wind. Um, and this plan was one of the first like city definitions created for the green economy um, that at least New York City has seen. So um, that definition is that it is the ecosystem act of activities that have emerged since the turn of the century that directly and intentionally contribute to achieving our, our climate goals. Um, this is going to be done in five ways, uh, or five goals that we're particularly focusing in at EDC, which is um, to decarbonize buildings and construction, develop a renewable energy system through systems like offshore wind, um, enable low car carbon alternatives in the transportation so sector, catalyze innovation in climate technologies, and then to build an equitable green economy system. Um, and this is really is to just reiterate the point. It's, it's a very expensive sector. Um, We've identified in our green economy plan eight sectors, and out of those eight sectors, there are 21 subsectors. And I'll just kind of hit the highlights for those, which are energy, buildings, transportation, waste, meaning recycling, uh, consumer products, thinking sustainable fashion, sustainable food, um, finance and consulting, actually. So there's a big uh, movement for green finance uh, and climate consulting and accounting. Um, resilience infrastructure, um, which I think a lot of y'all will be familiar with in this room. Um, and then policy and advocacy, of course, as well. Um, so it's, it's a robust industry with a lot of implications for workforce development, for a lot of implications for um, green jobs in New York City. It's a very exciting time to be, um, to be here. And so um, that's green economy. I think blue economy is a little trickier in terms of definition. Um, at EDC, we're trying to like really align our strategy, really understand what it is that we're trying to do in the blue economy space and stand up the maritime and marine sectors that we, we've identified. Um, we do a lot of like marine and waterfront construction, so obviously there's a really construction heavy um, component to uh, the blue economy that we're focused on, but it's obviously more expensive than that, thinking professional services like engineering, um, you know, some transportation, transportation logistics type firm can uh, uh, dip into the professional services side, um, manufacturing of course, metals fabrication, shipbuilding, um, there's a whole lot of jobs that exist out of the, uh, the, the blue economy as well. And I think you can actually get a really good definition if you look at The Economist in 2015, um, they uh, submitted a, like a, a, a readout, a reading um, to the World Ocean Summit um, that like, focused on two big uh, components that were policy and institutional uh, capacity uh, and business environment for coastal activities, um, where you could get a clear definition of exactly what, exa like, what really is happening within the blue economy. Um, and EDC wants to be involved in that as, um, as much as possible. We want to be really intentional about the waterfront spaces that we're involved in. Um, so more to come on that as we develop that strategy for us. But um, that ho hopefully that sets the stage a little bit. Before um, I move to the next question, though, I actually wanted to see perspective from you guys on how you see the green economy and how you see the blue economy. How would you define those um, very massive sectors? Yeah, I, I can start. And I just start by giving a quick <coughs> bio on myself. So I, I have a, a, like sort of an interesting nexus of the, the green and blue economies in my background. I, I have formal education in, um, in the maritime space. I went to the Merchant Marine Academy. Um, I spent a year at sea uh, and, you know, working on commercial ships. And so that gave, you know, like a, a really interesting deep sea um, integration into uh, professionalism. It was my first job out of school. So, um, you, you know, from there, um, I eventually found my way into working for a utility, uh, National Grid here. Um, um, in Brooklyn on Long Island and, um, you know, sort of made that transition uh, working on in the fossil fuel space uh, and now here working on uh, an offshore wind project, um, you know, cl clearly in, in the green space. So, you know, I, I do think that there's a really wide ranging, um, you know, very diverse um, suite of opportunities in both uh, of these, uh, you know, green and blue industries, uh, so to speak. And, um, you know, just talking about them individually, the, the, the maritime profession is one of the oldest professions in the world, right? Like the mo stuff moving on ships and um, whether that's, you know, maritime construction or, or transportation of goods and services or, 
and, and it's really critical here in New York, as it's one of the you know one of the largest ports in the world. Um, more stuff comes in and out of um, New York City and and New Jersey than anywhere else on the East Coast of the U.S. So. It's, it's a pretty critical spot, um, not only that we, um, you know, support and, and develop um, folks who can, who can support in the future, but, but also to, you know, understand how the environment's going to change and how, you know, the things that we need to be thinking about today in terms of infrastructure and, um, and, and waterfront type um, initiatives that we need to be thinking about now to set us up, to set us up for the future. Um, so, you know, on that on the side, and then you know clearly the, the the energy transition that's upon us here, uh, moving from a you know historically fossil based uh, energy sources here in New York, and and you know just looking at the commitments that New York and New Jersey are making towards um, you know green energy sources, offshore wind specifically, but you know green energy resources um, across the value chain and. So, you know, again, just, just really critical that we are having this conversation here today about what we can do to support, you know, folks who, who want to get involved in these, these different industries. That's great. Thank you. Andrea, did you have anything? Yeah, I think uh, for me, the definition is really important because for offshore wind, it's kind of where blue careers meet green careers. Um, and so it's important for us to talk about the intersection of what that means and the transferability of those skills, right? A lot of people look at the industry as something that's far-fetched and for the most important thing about blue and green careers is that we demystify what that means and how the skills that people have or can learn can really apply now or you can learn skills for green energy um, as we move forward because energy generation um, is pretty similar across different methods. And so how do we just take those skills, transfer them, and create opportunities for the future? Great. And, and I'll just add sort of, you know, by way of background, you've got two offshore wind people here, so I'm thinking they're thinking more blue, but, you know, there is really this huge nexus. And uh, I've been probably doing more green and starting to dabble in blue, uh, but my background is as an environmental engineer. Uh, from MIT, uh, but when I went, I was Navy ROTC, so you know I was definitely I understood what what blue was, uh, and then my first internship was actually working for the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. So I worked on the Boston Harbor cleanup project. It was not maritime, but it was more you know combined sewer overflows and, and sewage. I, I guess blue and brown uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, is, is a little bit of what it was. Uh, but then I worked uh, after doing semiconductor manufacturing and other things. I worked for Governor uh, Patrick and Governor Baker. So I did energy and environmental affairs and worked at the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. So I got to see a little bit of all of these. But when we typically think of green and we say clean energy and beyond, that beyond for us includes blue, it includes environmental, it includes climate, it includes food, it includes ag. We think of all of those things, and even as we think of green careers within um, energy, there are like there's so many roles and positions, and that's part of the issue. Is there's so much information asymmetry. There's all the renewable jobs, so that's offshore, but it's also solar. It's also geothermal. It's also hydro. Uh, but there's also the built environment. So thinking about bundling up homes, doing HVAC and all of that piece. And then there's the whole transportation piece. There's all the EV and the mobility. So there are jobs across all of those sectors. And I know I can, I can speak more about Massachusetts than New York. And any, anything in New York is going to be bigger <laughs> than in Massachusetts because you guys are just that much larger than we are. But I think we're estimating we need 35,000 electricians and they can go across all of those roles. How do we do that? Um, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, I, that's, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, I think actually it's a really great transition to our next question here, um, but I'll have Andrea, you answer this because you did mention some of the, that need for like learning skills and the transferability of skills um, to the sector. So um, what are some of the obstacles facing the development of green and blue pathways? Um, why, do we, why do we think now is a good time to be addressing those? Yeah, so I, I 
prefer to call them opportunities instead of obstacles mm. because offshore wind already has enough obstacles. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think, you know, one of the main, I think, is the awareness of the industry, right? People think offshore wind is new or solar is new or hydrogen is new. But like I said before, there are a lot of transferable skills you, you can use. And f like for the development phase of our industry, right, like careers such as communications, lawyers, people doing finance, like financial analysts work, a lot of our office work, you can, you can be in any industry and transfer that over. So I think a lot of um, the opportunity that we have now and acknowledging that this is an industry with a very long lead time, right? We are procuring projects. We have a couple under construction in the nation, but Boehm has announced that they're going to be leasing um, so many additional uh, sites around the country, and the state is procuring a lot of projects. Every state in the Northeast is procuring a lot of projects in the Gulf, um, on the West Coast. So how do we take that as an opportunity to really create um, education for the K through 12 space really integrated into pre-apprenticeship apprenticeship programs do the outreach to all levels of government to all universities higher eds and really open the uh, open eyes and uh, about the opportunities to anyone who's interested um, and create that pathway that says okay I can learn how to be a lawyer but maybe I want to go do that for energy and renewable energy or I can learn a marine trade and do fishing, or I can go be you know, a support vessel for the renewable energy industry. So just creating that visibility of something that's not tangible and has a really long lead time, hmm. um, and starting early, because we know that if we start with kids, it's gonna be way more successful, I think, than if we try to teach adults about it. Yeah, that's great. Any other thoughts from you too? Yeah, I mean, I would echo what Andrea said. You know, I think that the main thing that hit home is that there, there's very few things that are new about um, offshore wind specifically. Um, if you think about traditional fossil generation, um, there, there is a spinning thing that creates <laughs> electrons that goes through wires to our houses. And that's exactly what offshore wind is. It just happens to be... 50, 60 miles offshore. So, you know, while there are nuances and, and certainly challenges and opportunities to, to figure things out um, to meet those those nuanced challenges, but the uh, at the end of the day, the, the skills that we need um, from a foundational perspective are here. Um, we have a very advanced, um, you know, power generation fleet um, across the United States, and, and there are folks that know how to service that equipment. Um, there. Are, is a very advanced maritime community that's been, you know, doing business, whether it's fishing or transportation, um, um, coastwise, um, you know, deep sea work, um, construction or transportation, it, it exists here today. We have a very strong maritime community in the United States. So um, we need to figure out how to put maybe an oval peg in a, in a round hole versus <laughs> a, a square peg. but. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I, I do think that there's a lot of opportunities in the space, and, and there's certainly a commitment um, from, you know, the states to be able to support it. Yeah. And I, I would add, I sort of think of it as three sort of classes of opportunities, and we started talking about, I think Andrea was talking about one that I, I sort of loop them together in terms of, talked about information asymmetry, uh, there's some timing inconsistencies, and there's some translational issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I think Brian was saying, a lot of this stuff, if you look in the construction or mechanical space, it's some of the same stuff. People just don't speak the same language. And so you gotta like figure out how that is. And then on the timing inconsistencies, there are all these projects coming. You know, and I and I was I I had the I guess maybe maybe the pleasure <laughs> to see Cape Wind be sort of mitigated to death in Massachusetts before things started to open up. Mm -hmm. uh, but at, but as we look at that and we sort of sort of see um, you know, things are starting to open up now, but there are still timing inconsistencies. There's the regulatory permitting piece, there's manufacturing, there's design, there's construction, then there's maintenance. So all these jobs are coming, but when are they coming? And who knows? And so I just talked about electricians. Well, you can't just get be, become an electrician. That's a five-year apprentice mm -hmm. process. So when do you start these people? And, you know, we talk about 
this thing called promise fatigue. We can't keep relying on people to get trained for jobs and those jobs aren't there. And so we've got to do a better job as an industry of connecting those things. And then I, I think that goes back to the information asymmetry. How are we educating people? So I loop all of those in sort of one bucket. The second bucket is I think there are things that are like education things. Forget about green or blue or offshore or whatnot. I think they're just issues with educating people in terms of, especially for this type of work, you know, childcare, transportation, certifications, hardware, software. These aren't things that come in a traditional Pell Grant or scholarship. How do we do that piece? And then I think the third piece for me that is missing is most people don't have jobs with Fortune 500 or Fortune 100 companies. They have jobs with small companies and small businesses. And when you talk about disaggregated, fragmented, small, and dispersed, this is it. Uh, you know, after you get, and I'll, and I'll stick with when, tier ones, tier twos, big, big boys, but tier threes, tier fours, tier fives, like that's a whole lot of stuff that most people don't really understand how it works. So how do we map that out in a better way? Yeah, I think um, those are really great responses. I think uh, from the city's perspective, how we're like, at least at EDC, how we're trying to respond to this, um, on the workforce development team, we, we sort of follow the CUNY model, right, of like connecting people to career pipelines, right? So that is three stages of career, um, I guess, or workforce development, right, which is career awareness, career preparation, and career, de uh, career development. Um, and we're trying to fill in those gaps at each of those stages, particularly uh, the career awareness phase for the green economy and blue economy, because just as they were talking about, I think people are just not necessarily aware at this point um, about like what's what what opportunities there are. So I'll stand up one of the things that EDC's done, um, which is the Offshore Wind and Maritime Career Awareness Fair. Um, actually, again, my colleague leads that um, pretty expertly, if I may say so myself. Um, that brings in 500 uh, students from CTE programs across the city um, to get them connected to uh, maritime and marine uh, experts, uh, offshore wind experts, industry folks, to just discuss and learn about um, what opportunities are happening in, in these fields. Um, because right as they're saying, these, these blue and green economy job sectors um, are really overlapping, especially in the offshore wind space. Um, and so we're trying to make, uh, you know, CUNY, uh, well, young students aware of it, the K through 12 system aware of these opportunities. Um, in the CUNY system, we're work we have a partnership with uh, KCC, the Kingsborough uh, Community College, um, which, with their Division of Workforce Development, Continuing Education Strategic Partnerships. Um, we invested $480,000 of uh, community, uh, city tax levy funding um, to provide training in uh, offshore wind workforce development pr training programs, um, namely maritime career training, um, global wind, like GWO certification, which is a big component, very expensive certification for people who actually want to work on the, um, on the platforms themselves uh, to actually do the offshore wind work. Um, and also offshore wind welding is another training that we're uh, that, that's, that's attempting to fund, which is, we're really excited about those, um, those initiatives. Uh, we also have the prop tech piloting program that kind of fits in the career development phase. Um, this is a, this, the aim of this program is to create programmatic infrastructure um, and pathways to city collab, uh, to the city collaboration for prop tech startups looking to gain proof of concept and address key um, priorities and agency asset challenges. Um, these are going to be, a, a, these prop tech pilots are going to be deployed across EDC, DCAS, and NYCHA assets. Um, they've actually graduated eight interns in fiscal year 23, um, and eight are currently in the spring 24 cohort. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different like, elements that we're trying to do. And we're also trying to stand up businesses, especially businesses from an equitable, uh, like an equitable perspective. So thinking, how are we engaging MWBEs um, within the blue, blue and green economy spaces? So we actually have a program that's called Offshore Wind Waterfront Pathways. Um, this is a, a program that's designed by and for MWBEs who want to engage in offshore wind and waterfront development programs. And that's for both construction and professional service firms. So. Well, yes, Minority Women Disadvantaged Business Enterprises is MW. Thank you. That's a very good um, call out to make. Sometimes we get lost in the industry jargon, so thank you for that. Um, yes, yeah, so we're, we're trying to make sure that this is done equitably, that this is done thoughtfully, that we're engaging communities like Sunset Park, like Red Hook, like the North Shore of Staten Island, and trying to really be thoughtful about how um, folks who are living in environmental justice communities who have disproportionately been uh, bearing the brunt of these climate impacts are, are being engaged in the, the proliferation of the blue and green economy. So we want to. Um, I just wanted to highlight those things as um, 
the city is working actively to address some of the barriers that they're discussing, um, and they're great partners in that work. Um, so that's great. Um, we'll move to the next question. <laughs> um, so I, I want to ask now, what are some of the industries that are becoming greener, um, and how are they implementing strategies to attract new talent to green and blue jobs? And uh, Carrie, if you want to go ahead and take us off for green careers, I think you had. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm happy to start. And I can just talk about a few of the things that, you know, and partners that we're working with. Uh, you know, some in offshore, but, you know, some in other uh, areas. So if I think in, in, in workforce, um, a couple of things that we are doing, and we've got a, a, a significant amount of funding from the, our quasi, the Massachusetts uh, Clean Energy Center. And so we, we're doing some work in offshore around, you know, exactly what you were talking about. Of, you know, how do we get out there and do awareness? So we got a group called Prospects or, that is really about going out and doing things in high schools and elementary schools, uh, you know, job, job fairs or career fairs so people can see what green jobs look like and get to hear from people in the, in the industry and in the, in the space because that's super important. You know, I was just talking to my friend, uh, Reverend Willie Bodrick uh, from Roxbury, and I just think about somebody from, you know, a 13-year-old girl from the Timothy Middle School, she's never going to see a, a, a blade, you know, coming down mm. Blue Hill Avenue, you know, in Roxbury. It's going to come through a port like New Bedford or somewhere. And so if we don't tell her that there are jobs in this space, she's never going to know it. Uh, and so how do we get out there and do that? The other thing we do, um, and, and we're targeted, you know, as our name says, brown in the green space, own black and brown and low to moderate income uh, communities. Uh, another project we're doing is uh, we're running a, a targeted program uh, for the state's uh, clean energy summer internship program. You know, I, I, I mentioned before I went to MIT and I was talking to one of my uh, friends who's now at Avangrid, but she used to be at uh, Mass Clean Energy Center. She was running the program. <clears throat> and we were bringing in like close to 600 students a year, but I did not see a lot of black and brown ones. And so I said, I love, you know, I love MIT, I love engineers, I love tech bras, but all of the state's money can't go to them. And so how do we make sure that other people are getting to see it? And also, how do you incentivize? Uh, so the way the state works this program is you can, you know, get subsidized like up to two, two engineers, two, not engineers, they don't have to be engineers, two interns, but you can actually get a third if you pull the third one from a community college. So how do we actually get more, you know, because oftentimes, you know, we just moved to uh, sort of skills-based hiring in Massachusetts, but uh, Boston definitely is a, I would say we're, we're what is it, like degree snobs. Um, you know, I, I look good on paper, but it shouldn't be about that. It should be about can you do the work? You don't have to have a degree from MIT to do a lot of, uh, most jobs. Mm. And so how do you just see what is it that people need? I think the other thing, and, I, and I'm, I'll stop, uh, just do a couple more. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at, and actually working with a company out of New York, uh, out of Brooklyn, uh, we're working with uh, Block Power uh, to bring their civilian climate core to Boston. Uh, for returning citizens, specifically uh, focused on people who have been formerly incarcerated. So we actually kicked off a cohort two or three weeks ago uh, where we were doing that, and that's not in offshore, that's in like HVAC. Uh, like how do we train people to become HVAC uh, technicians or, or, or mechanics, um, you know, and get more of those folk who are returning actually returning and having good paying, you know, green collar jobs uh, and the last one I'll say is green collar jobs are both blue collar and white collar. Uh, and so we're also working with the uh, Exodus group out of Aberdeen, Scotland. Uh, they actually are winding down their X Academy in the UK. But what this was is sort of like a post-grad program to do rotational things. Because you can't learn, you know, for those of you still in school, you, you can't learn everything in school. And you actually don't learn most stuff in school. Uh, you, you, you learn most, you get the sort of theory, uh, but you have to go work to get the practice. Uh, and you've got, as almost everything is in a sense, a bit of an apprenticeship. And so this is a program to rotate people through the wind space. And so we're actually fundraising and looking to start a pilot of that program here. We're, we're doing some other things, but I'll, I'll stop there. 
you have guys, anything you guys wanted to add to that? Yeah, I mean, when you, you know, when you ask the question of what jobs are green jobs, what jobs are blue jobs, I, I think that it it spans across all mm -hmm. industries, really. And, you know, if you look at what's happening here in New York, you know, anything that anything that's related to a building is a green job, in my, you know, my opinion. Local Law 97 went a really long way to talking about efficiency standards and lowering greenhouse gas emissions for for the buildings which is you know if you look out the window the the biggest part about new york so um we talked a lot about maritime and energy transportation you know you, you name it, it it can be a green job and and all of that stuff that you build or do in a building you know a lot of it comes to new york on a boat so you know, there, there's, there's a lot of up and down the supply chain, you know, on the, in ports, out at sea, those are all blue jobs that support green jobs. So, um, you know, I don't know if you can emphasize enough that when you talk about career pathways and, and you know, wanting to get in at the ground level on, on a brand new industry, a lot of it's not new. You know, building those foundational skills um, through traditional pathways, I think, gets you in a place where you can be ready to support these industries as they continue to grow. And before Andrea jumps in, I'm j jumps in, I'm just thinking as Brian is talking, I'm literally looking out at a an earth mover or a yep. backhoe, <laughs> like going as we're talking. And so uh, he or she or they who are, who are in there, they, they may not think they're in a green job, but they're they're in, they're in a green job, uh, most likely. I think if you want to go to the next question, I saw a time reminder. So yeah, yeah, that's totally <laughs> fine. Um, I, yeah, I actually want to uh, go ahead and really quickly see if anyone wants to address uh, one of the things that was brought up at the beginning, which is uh, challenges posed by an aging workforce. Um, how can we connect um, aging workforce into this uh, into this industry? I mean, I can talk about my experience in this. When I came to work at National Grid, um, the, it was the best description of this question that I've ever heard. It but, they, they described it as if it was a barbell, the, the workforce that we had or the folks that we had working at National Grid. And the, and the area that I was in, they, it was described as a barbell, whereas in the early 90s, they hired a whole bunch of people. And they didn't hire anybody for 15, 20 years. And then around you know, my, um, uh, my tenure, they, they hired a whole bunch of people. So, uh, you, you know, and I think that, you know, I think in today's day and age, just with the the way that defined benefit programs have, have kind of phased out, I, I think that there is more of an intermingling, especially within industries, um, of folks that have that come with really interesting, diverse sets of skills. And I think in a lot of ways that's a good thing. You know, whereas I think traditionally in the past you would go to one job, you would stay there your whole career, advance in very long branched uh, incremental steps. Now, you know, people are moving around. People are experiencing different things and bringing these different experiences to, uh, to where they're working at um, at the time. And, and honestly, I think that's a really good thing. And I think having that diverse set of experiences through movement um, in, in folks' careers, um, especially in an emerging industry like offshore wind is, is really valuable. I can just tell you, um, I, don't, I don't know if you experienced the same thing, but you know, folks at Community Offshore Wind come from, from everywhere. You know, there's, there aren't very many uh, long tenured offshore wind um, <laughs> technical experts, you know, that we have those too, but that most of the folks come from, you know, all different walks of life. Yeah, I'll just chime in. I, I also see, you know, our aging workforce um, as an opportunity, and I think it's uh, part of some th a term that kind of gets tossed around, but I think is really important, which is a just transition, right? Just because we have a set of older folks that has worked in a fossil fuel industry and is has a different set of experience doesn't mean that we can't take their learned experience and really transfer it to younger generations. Um, I think that there's a lot that we can take um, from that and have them as mentors and people who can really tran like teach them transferable skills that are going to last them through through their whole lifetime. Um, and that's whether you're doing work onshore, offshore, wherever, you know, if you're talking about electricians, right, like your foreman who's been on, on the job as a foreman for 20 years, that guy's got a lot of knowledge to teach somebody who is a first year apprentice. 
So I, I don't think that you know our aging workforce is, a much, is as much of a problem as how do we create the, the right kind of corporate environments for that knowledge transfer mm -hmm. to happen and for us to really take advantage of that. Um, I worked for, for a while for an organization called WDI and, and we worked with a lot of manufacturing companies and they were always talking about you know their workforce retiring. And my number one thing to them was like, okay, instead of you waiting until your guy is about to retire in three months, hire somebody a couple of years before and have that guy train the new people, right? Like, that's what we need. It's not, it's not a problem to have an aging workforce. It's how do we prepare to transfer those skills so that we're not left in, in a big data hole of knowledge. Yeah. And just one thing to add to that, you know, like Brian was saying, you know, offshore wind is nascent, so it's, it's pretty pretty mixed, but, you know, when I was working for Mass uh, DEP, you know, we were looking at the wastewater infrastructure and water, um, you know, delivery side, and, you know, the average age was like 55 plus or so, and it was typically, if you think about the sort of, you know, the persona, it was typically an old, you know, old, old white guy. Uh, and so, you know, when Andrew talked about an opportunity, it's an opportunity to, to change that over and, and make it where you're bringing in some younger folk, but you're also bringing in some women and you're bringing in some people of color. So there's an opportunity to just have a just transition, mm -hmm. not just from fossil fuel, but also from water and some old infrastructure places where most of those jobs went to a, you know, certain demographic of the population. That's great. That's very. I think it's just to sum it up. It's really. It really is just not a not a demographic that we should be worried about. It's one that we should be directly looking into pulling our talent from that um, from that demographic. So that's really great. Thank you. Mm. Well, yeah, and maybe we should do those jobs, yeah. but you don't need to do those workers. Mm. Right. And we do infrequently help make the mental transition to elected officials, appointed officials, and decision makers that you're not trying to throw away people. Yeah. You're just, our communities will be better off if they have non polluting jobs for a whole set of reasons. So let's, instead of having the pipe fitters fight us, on this, let's come up with a structure where we collectively make the transition for the people who will need their particular job mm. to see how they will have this job, as opposed to just saying, quote, you're casting us out. Think of how much, I mean, and we've done this before, often poorly, you know. So <laughs> coal miners, you know, are very, very entrenched in continuing to mine coal because they want to have an income. Many of them may not be thrilled to be coal miners if you look at Black London Beach and a whole lot of other things. But if we were looking at a, a from maybe let's call it a higher perspective, I mean literally, physically, mm -hmm. higher, you know, elevation. So it's I'm not just firing and getting rid of you, but we're making a an energy transition, energy use transition. But we haven't been very good and adept mm -hmm. at making barriers and, and the language see these as an opportunity to make this work for communities and a set of workers as opposed to being uh, resistance to where people become entrenched. We've got to keep these jobs that kill people, you know. Yeah. So we, there's a lot of sub subtlety uh, and not so subtle the ways in which we can actually do a much better job of this. Yeah, and I would, I would just say that goes back to the information asymmetry, mm -hmm. the translation, because a lot of those jobs, the skills are really transferable to other places, but the narrative is coming from one side sort of saying keep them versus how do we elevate them and move them and do the matching uh, to get them into other roles. So we, we've, got, we've got to always got to do a better job of storytelling and telling the narrative. And that's great. I think also a missing component of this is that these are actually really well, like good paying jobs. They, they offer family sustaining wages across both industries that blue and green economy do. So um, I, I know that's probably obvious to a lot of you, but that's a, that we can't, 
leave that part of the equation out of it, right? That especially for people who are transitioning and have families to take care of, like that's a, that's a huge component of this. So um, thank you so much for this discussion. And we actually had a couple more questions, but I think it's actually now time to kick it to uh, the Q&A. Um, so perhaps you guys will be answering or asking questions that were on my sheet here. Um, so let's go ahead and begin that now, if that's all right. Thank you. Right, we have the mic in the back. Um, if you just raise your hand, she'll come around to you. Uh, I have more of a comment, but I'm curious the thoughts from <laughs> all of you. I thought this panel would be about something different. <laughs> and I wanted to ask about where vegetation management and horticulture come in. To me, these are like the OG green jobs. And I worry that because they're not like generating money or wealth, that they're getting lost in the sauce, so to say. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make a comment, that comment, and ask if and in any of your work you work with people in this field or talk about those types of like horticultural forestry, like um, managing vegetation, which is also, a, yeah, living shorelines, also climate, really important for climate resilience, both on our shorelines and inland, and just I feel like it's getting lost a little bit. Mm, that's great. Any first passes at that? Yeah, I can. Uh, so, so when I talked about clean energy being, you know, clean energy and beyond, and green and environmental, I think definitely green infrastructure is a huge, you know, overlap and nexus with that. And I think there was a lot of work going on there. You know, you know, vegetative, you know, all, all those different pieces. Like who's maintaining that, and also thinking about how do we keep jobs sort of local, you, you can't outsource green infrastructure jobs, that, that needs to be right there in the neighborhood. And I think something I, I think Preston may have brought up or that we didn't really touch, uh, we talked about uh, like, why is this important now? Uh, one of the big reasons is, you know, we live in a, uh, you know, a, a, a democracy, but we also live in a capitalist society. So a lot of things come, come down to money. Uh, and a lot of the big reasons these things are are happening is on the offshore side, there are bids that are being out put out there, and so that's allowing that. But also, you know, we talk about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. We talk about Inflation Reduction Act, Chips and Science Act, uh, the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. There are billions of dollars uh, that are out, uh, and and what, like 40 percent of that is targeted at, you know, what we call, you know, I would say underserved or environmental justice or in Massachusetts talk about gateway cities and so that's sort of the now question but I definitely think green inf infrastructure horticulture some of the conservation uh, pieces and especially as I talk about the small businesses on the tech side you know one of the areas that's booming is is ag tech you know you know ag tech and all of that is really you know going because um, and, I'll, and I'll give this you know quick anecdote when I worked for the state I did brownfields I did environmental justice and I sat on our food policy council. And I remember going to a food policy conference and the, there were farmers saying, I don't do this to make money. And I'm going, <laughs> like, why are you doing it? Like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an MBA and I'm going, you know, and I'm, I don't think I'm like hardcore, like, you know, cutthroat MBA, but I'm going, if you, you do something, you make money from it and everybody's got to eat. So it's like, you've got the largest market like nobody is out of this market so people will pay we just from a government perspective we need to figure that piece out too and like what's subsidized what's not like how do we you know to me it all goes back to economics and i think we're starting to get a better handle on you know what we call the the tragedy of the common you know you talked about being at the epa i'm, I'm 52 you know i'm uh, you know as old as the epa it's not that old and so we didn't have all these regs and rules before. Now that they're there, it gives opportunity for, for more things to, to take place. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, one in Next the back. Question. Yeah, right one here and one back there. Got a bunch of them. <laughs> so I was interning at EPA. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, just a quick comment and a quick question. Uh, the first question from another comment, looking to agrivoltaics, uh, 
Mm-hmm. That's yeah. the future of farming and solar. It's beautiful mm-hmm. what they're doing with animal husbandry mm-hmm. and that. Um, offshore wind has been really great in their efforts to do community outreach, especially about job creation. But whenever I see flyers or announcements, you don't really emphasize the land, the shore positions, which was mentioned today. You could be a lawyer for Wall Street, you could be a lawyer for Equinor. You know, this happens. So uh, my suggestion and comment is when you put out a flyer, list you're working for electricians, plumbers, seam fitters, but also admins, HR managers, Mm -hmm. grant writers, the land positions. So people weren't thinking, because a lot of people thinking offshore wind means I'm gonna be on a boat. It doesn't mean that yeah. for majority of the jobs, but I don't see that being emphasized to get more people to your community outreach. Speaking of which, you guys have been doing amazing with community outreach, but the other renewables are solely, sorely lacking in reaching out to say, we have jobs in solar, we need electricians, we need people who can install. Same with hydro and every other renewable energy. Would you ever share lessons learned with these complementary technologies, they're not competing. When the wind blows, the sun isn't usually shining. <laughs> so I'm um, just wondering if you guys would ever share lessons learned with other community uh, energies. I, I mean, in, across the industry, we, we do collaborate. Um, and if anybody asks me, I'm happy to talk. I, I mean, I think the most important part of community outreach is, is it all comes down to as local as you can get. Um, and I think that's the most important part that we forget, right? Like we, you can be developing a 1300 megawatt project 50 miles offshore and the most important thing is how well and how closely do you know your landfall community? How much trust do you have with that community, with the community partners that are there, the municipal partners, your tribal partners, your fisheries partners? and how strong have you built those trust relationships so that they can be a voice for you while you are also being a voice for them. That's, that's kind of the, the baseline of, of how I, I approach that, um, but I'm happy to anytime collaborate with partners because we also think that you know the transition to renewable energy is definitely not just wind, um, and it's a transition that's gonna take us a long time. Yeah, I think one of the things I'm surprised they haven't mentioned yet, um, there's so many programs that EDC does and gets involved with, but one of the big ones is our $100 million investment in the Climate Innovation Hub at Brooklyn Army Terminal. Um, That is incubated as a space for people across green energy sectors to come and collaborate. Um, That's that's in development right now. Um, That's a huge opportunity to share those kind of learnings, exactly like what you're talking about, um, for people in the offshore uh, offshore wind industry to meet folks in the solar and, um, you know, EV, EV, industry, battery storage, all of those, right? Like that's that's what we're trying to see proliferate um, really strongly. We're trying to create these really nice networks and hubs for um, sh- like ideas and communication to really uh, be fostered um, holistically across the green economy uh, space. So um, it is something that is being thought about. It is something that we are, um, at least the city is actively trying to engage in. Um, so yeah. We got about time for one more question, I think. Yeah, either, yeah. Um, <laughs> Or ask both of them and we'll, we'll yeah. see. We'll, we'll do them quick. Ask them quick. Ask them quick and we'll, 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 we'll do it. But go, go. Yeah, okay, we'll go. okay, we'll okay. Go. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess in some ways what you all are working on and you know, the, uh, uh, trying to find ways that the launch of a new or, or expanding industry you know, creates economic mobility. You know, it's not do it's not new. It's been done in the past. Maybe it can be done better, more inclusively. So I'm curious: Are there past efforts that you look to for lessons? You know, either positive lessons or let's not do it like that from past efforts, so that you know we do it better this time, um, and also so that we um, like kind of like you mentioned about the 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 coal industry so that we also build a, con- uh, a political constituency that you know actually buys in and sees uh, offshore wind or, or any kind of energy transition as economic opportunity rather than seeing it as some kind of job killer or something like that. Um, so. Yeah, I could take a shot at that. And, you know, I think when, when you look back in history, you talk about lessons learned, y- y- there have been several energy transitions in history. You could go back in England when they transitioned from wood to coal, 
you know, you could talk about much more recently, there's been a transition from oil to gas or coal to gas here in the United States. Um, you could talk about uh, successful projects like, um, uh, you know, the Tennessee Valley and their hydro work up in the Pacific Northwest. They, they also, you know, their electric prices are their electric system is is typically um, close to carbon carbon neutral. Uh, if you look across the um, the value chain in the Pacific Northwest, and it's also one of the cheapest because of some of the solutions that they've had. So that's probably a good success. You could look at, you know, the um, uh, we could argue about the merits of, of nuclear, but the, you know, nuclear typically um, has been unsuccessful lately um, at a large scale and when I say lately I mean the last couple of decades I'm not talking about the small modular stuff um, so you know I think that there is a lot to learn if you look back into history and the one thing that I take out of all of that is to not try and make it too difficult yes it's extremely difficult yes there are a ton of challenges but what we need to focus on is everybody needs to focus on their individual part in this transition rather than ever trying to make everything very macro. And so I, can, I, I think if we, and Andrea said something before that, that sort of hit home, if we can create or organizational cultures within these transitional periods that really foster growth and, and they foster the eventual implementation of these solutions, you know, for me selfishly, that's offshore wind. But you know, if, if we can create a successful project, a community offshore wind, that goes you know, a long way in developing the pipeline that's going to come behind us. And so our ultimate mission as a project is to develop an offshore wind project. And, and so um, focusing on that is, is really key for me. And that's the lesson that I would learn out of the, you know, the projects that have been successful in the past. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quick because I think we need to go. But I think for me, the lessons learned is, uh, so I'm first generation immigrant. I came here when I was 10 and my parents didn't really speak English, so from then on I was kind of on my own. Um, and so what I think about that is how do we create as many opportunities and access for people who are traditionally left out of a brand new industry, brand new, um, you know, we're kind of starting from scratch in some ways, and Veneered Offshore just signed a tribal benefits agreement. It's the first one of its kind a few months ago. It took us a lot of work, a lot of meetings, um, but it's really transformative, right? We know that tribal nations have been left out of any sort of engagement for hundreds of years in addition to everything they've endured. Um, and so that goes from tribal nations to where are you citing your infrastructure projects? Are you just citing them in the same communities that have already um, had to deal with the effects of other infrastructure projects? Who is getting the benefits? Who's getting the jobs? How are you doing that? So it really goes to lear learning all the lessons of what's everybody, like all the inputs and all the, commu all the community um, feedback of what they feel has gone wrong in the past and putting that into practice of how do we develop different methods for doing that moving forward. That's great. I think we're at time. Um, if you have like individual question, uh, can we can we take this last question? If you're okay with it. The election is necessary as we think about, no seriously, yeah. that one? as That's we think about one. all the, the, these, I mean, I, I, we're working on trying to get middle school workers into green, blue tech and all these things, but there are real threats to alternative energy sources and the ways in which we're doing this. And I do wonder how companies are positioning themselves with the chilling of many of the markets as a result of not knowing what's going to happen in November and how we're going to respond if it does not go in a way in which many people would like it to go uh, in relation to energy sources. So I, I think there is a question for. Yeah, it's an extremely important question. I, and I, I honestly, I thank you for asking it because I, I think it's something that we have to be really mindful about. Um, I will say from EDC's perspective, we're grabbing every federal dollar we can right now, right? And we're trying to make sure that they're, <laughs> they are dumped into these these programs. Um, and, I, and I know we like we laugh, but like that's that's real. We want to make sure that we're we're getting as far along in these projects as we possibly can, um, thinking ahead, thinking futuristically about the potential of something like this, right? Um, I think we're at least us as a city agency, and at least the politics of New York, like we're we're so we're so committed to like making sure this industry comes alive, um, to, to like making sure that there's a lot of real success here, um, despite what happens in November. I think that we're we're yeah. authentically really working hard to to make sure we're well poised for whatever um, political like 
woes come in the future, I think. Um, yeah. I don't know if you guys have any. I'll, I'll give you just a more general uh, response, just from a completely business perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to deal with risk. It's very difficult to deal with uncertainty. And so I think that's what you're saying. And so, uh, you know, when posed with uncertainty, typically the, the business case, and I'll let the actual business people talk a little bit about it, but, you know, in a sense you have to sort of think about both ways and sort of be planning, uh, you know, sort of decision model analysis. If yes, it goes this way. If no, it goes this way. Or if A, you do B. And so it just takes a little bit of more extra effort to really be planning for both scenarios. Yeah, and that coordination happens at the local, state, federal level, right, between all of us and then with our industry partners as well. Um, which brings me to uh, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for you all for joining us for this session. Really appreciate your time.